Do you use artificial sweeteners? Do you add them to your tea or to your coffee each day? If you do, you're probably doing it because you've heard of how bad sugar is and how sugar promotes obesity and diabetes. In fact, artificial sweeteners were developed for that reason because the thinking was that they would decrease risk of insulin resistance and obesity when used instead of sugar. But what research is showing is that that just isn't true. And that's what I want to dive into today. I want to show you how the use of artificial sweeteners is actually changing your gut microbiome, decreasing your society, your satiety or your satisfaction from food, and actually increasing the calories you're consuming and increasing your risk for diabetes and obesity. I'm Dr. John Bartimus, and I'm putting the pieces together to help you live a life at Optimal. There are various artificial sweeteners on the market and they come in all different color packets. You have the pink one, you have the blue one, you have the white one, you have the yellow one. What does that mean? Well, besides branding, it also helps us know the ingredient or the chemical used to create that artificial sweetener. For example, Splenda is made with sucralose. Well, sucralose is 600 times more sweet to your tongue and to your brain than sugar. And sucralose can be metabolized to dioxin, and dioxin is a major poison to our body and to our system. Aspartame is in equal in NutraSweet, and aspartame is the highest selling artificial sweetener in the world at 16,000 tons per year in the US. Aspartame has been shown in the research to be toxic to your kidneys, toxic to your brain because it promotes excitotoxicity. And if you don't know what that is, search my YouTube channel for the video I did on excitotoxicity a couple years ago. But basically what it does is aspartic acid, which is part of aspartame, activates the NMDA receptors in the brain, increasing calcium influx into the cells, leading to explosion or death of those neurons. So aspartame is not good. Other studies have shown that aspartame drives cognitive dysfunction by this excitotoxic pathway and is, is brain damaging. So aspartame is something that needs to be reevaluated in terms of use, whether at recommended levels or at higher than recommended levels. Studies have looked at use of aspartame at recommended levels and higher than recommended levels and they find that it's damaging to tissues body-wide whether you're taking it in the doses recommended or at levels higher than recommended. Sweet and low is the pink one and sweet and low is saccharin. Saccharin is 700 times more sweet than sugar. So when we're adding things this sweet to our diet, we're, we're tricking the brain and we're changing our digestion and our caloric intake. How does this occur? Well, when we eat, let's look at normal first. When we consume sugar, sugar hits the tongue and sends a message to the brain that leads to reward and satisfaction. So when the sugar hits the brain, the signal goes from the oral receptors in your mouth to the hypothalamus and to the amygdala. And that signals the reward of eating the sugar. Like you get that dopamine rush, you're like, oh, that's so good. I want more of that. What else is happening is once you get that reward and that satisfaction when you're consuming sugar, the sweetness of the sugar, but also the caloric content of the food is triggering post-ingestion signals in the body, which means the brain is, is expecting food and caloric density to follow that sweetness. So it's triggering hormonal release and other activations of the rest of the GI tract downstream to prepare for the incoming food that has been uh, the signal has been triggered by the sugar. So in this way, the GI tract is ready when the food comes down to digest it and absorb it and do what it does. 
So that's what happens normally when you consume sugar. And at some point, the bulk of the food, the caloric density of the food, is triggering different receptors in the GI tract to trigger back to your brain and say, hey man, we're full down here, you can stop eating. That's satiety or being satiated or satisfied. Okay, so that's with normal consumption of sugar and calorically dense food. Now, if you consume an artificial sweetener instead, the artificial sweetener is going to hit the tongue. The artificial sweetener is going to go to the hypothalamus and the amygdala. It's going to create a reward sensation and satisfaction because if sugar created reward and satisfaction, we're adding a, now an artificial sweetener that's depending on which one you're consuming is 200 to 700 times sweeter than sugar. You're definitely going to get a reward sensation from that and a satisfaction sensation from that. The problem is these artificial sweeteners have zero caloric density or very minimal caloric density depending on which one you're using. So then the post ingestion effects don't occur. This isn't happening. So you're consuming a super sweet product, but you're not priming the GI tract and setting up the hormonal release and the other physiologic processes downstream to be prepared for the food to come. So satiety isn't activated. So the, the message is saying, hey, we're full down here, stop sending it. That's not happening at the level that it is normally. So you consume more calories and therefore you gain more weight. And consuming more calories, gaining more weight, all of that promotes uh, glucose dysregulation or your blood sugar being dysregulated or dysfunctional and that promotes type 2 diabetes. So when you look in the research and they say does artificial sweetener consumption increase risk of diabetes or increase risk of obesity, the answers are yes. And what they found is even in pregnant women that artificial sweetener consumption in pregnant women, the more they consume, the higher their risk of overweight or higher BMI in their infant. So infants born to mothers that consumed a lot of artificial sweeteners during their pregnancy have a higher body mass index or a higher weight at age one year. So you can epigenetically be setting the child up for overweight and or obesity via artificial sweetener consumption. So they're not as benign as originally marketed and of course there's going to be pushback on this because if this is true, which the data continues to show that it is, then corporations potentially could be liable. So you always want to follow the money trail in this stuff as well. So the take home here is that you cannot, absolutely cannot, trade out sugar for an artificial sweetener and not have metabolic effects. So if you are trying to do better from a nutrition standpoint and you say, well, I'm going to cut out sugar because it's high calorie and I'm going to just add an artificial sweetener because it's no calorie and, and I'm not going to have any negative effects, that's not true. The negative effects you're going to have are going to change your brain and your behavior. They're going to change your GI function. They're going to change your body mass index and increase your risk for diabetes and obesity. And this is dose dependent in the studies. So the more you use, the higher the risks. And it's dose dependent in terms of frequency, so how often do you use it, and duration, how long do you use it. So if you're using high frequency, you use it all day, every day, and long duration for years, you're going to be more set up or more dysfunctional from a microbiome perspective, from a brain gut axis perspective, from a neurobehavioral perspective, and from a body mass index obesity type 2 diabetes risk perspective. Take home, there is no free lunch with artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners are just what they're called. They're artificial. They're man-made chemicals in a lab and if you look at human history we haven't often improved on nature chemically with zero side effects. So it's beginning to look like consuming the sugar is better and safer than consuming these man-made artificial sweeteners because at least we're not tricking the brain and changing physiology to the extent that the artificial sweeteners do with the sugar. 
with the sugar at least we get satiety and there is a stop signal. With the sugar we can choose to not eat sugar and not eat our artificial sweeteners and create healthy impacts from that. If you do need sweeteners that you don't want to use sugar, then you can consider stevia, which can still create some of this because it does have 700 times more sweetness than sugar. But studies on stevia show that postprandial glucose changes are not anywhere close to as high as they are with aspartame. So stevia would be a better choice there. And then sugar alcohols could be used like xylitol. Um, you want to make sure it's coming from its natural source and it's not a chemically constructed xylitol. So take home, you want to use natural foods, whole foods, limit your sugar, and don't replace sugar with artificial sweetener and think you'll be better off because you're not. One study looked at replacing sugar-based beverages with artificial sweetener-based beverages and risk for type 2 diabetes, and there was no difference between the two. The more sugar drinks you drink, the higher your risk of type 2 diabetes. The more artificial sweetened drinks you drink, the higher your risk for type 2 diabetes. So there's no free lunch. Zero calories doesn't mean zero side effects. Make smart choices and please share widely.